in the midst of fighting, someone who got knocked out, they jumped on them like fucking hyenas, bro. They were tired of fighting. They were fighting for 15 minutes. But because someone placed you in the room, you get charged with? No, I was there. I I, I contributed to it. Oh, so you did Because when I knocked them out, they stabbed them. <laughs> oh, so you were a part of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And after that, I hit somebody in the face with a rebar. That had it all. Bats, bottles, sticks, chains, rebar. But you weren't planning on killing this individual that day? No, of course not. I was fucking smoking a joint, looking and thinking about what I was going to do for tomorrow. On today's episode, we have William Leahy, a former gang member that ends up getting charged with murder in the second degree and sentenced to prison. In this episode, we dive into how his childhood led him down a bad path, what led him to become charged with murder, and what it's like to be a gang member in prison. Thank you, everyone, the viewers, the listeners that tune in week after week and support this show. We are a top 200 podcast out of 5 million plus podcasts in the world, all because of you guys. It means the absolute world and we would not be here without you. Remember, if you're interested in coming on the Locked In with Ian Bick show, you could go to our website, ianbick.com, click on the Be A Guest tab in the contact section, fill out that form and we'll be in touch with you as soon as scheduling allows. I hope you all sit back, relax, and get ready to get locked in with William Leahy. William, welcome to Locked In, man. Uh, you had a nice train ride here today, not too cold out, but you're looking really cozy, lumberjacky. Uh, how are you doing today? Good, bro. I'm, uh, you know, it's a good vibe, a uh, good ride. But let me start. We should we recording right yeah, now? Yeah, you're good, man. Be, All right, so we, be natural. Be yourself. Yeah, let me you know? just <laughs> you're in the, the zone, vibe. man. Yeah, you're yeah, locked yeah. in. You're in the hot seat. Got the lights on you right now. Nah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> nah, so it was a good, it was a good ride, man. I was thinking a lot. Um, usually I drive, but I decided, you know. You have a car in the city? Yeah. Oh, isn't that expensive? It's super expensive. <laughs> Once you find parking, you don't want to move. Right? Yeah, sometimes when I'll go and visit my cousins and stuff in the city, I, I always drive. I hate taking the train, but uh, sometimes I'll get tickets or it's hard to find a spot or some garages are 100 bucks, others are 50 It's crazy. But um, let's get into it, man. Let's start at the beginning of your story. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? What's like that early childhood like for Will? Okay, um, so can't really speak about my child unless I speak about my parents, right? Um, my father was a merchant marine uh, from the age of 19 to like 68. Um, gone most of the time, uh, seen him maybe like once a year, if that, right? Uh, mother, she uh, she picked up a bad habit, uh, a lot of drugs, uh, you know, addicted to crack and other things, pills, you know, it starts off with that kind of stuff. Um, I was born in Downstate Hospital in Brooklyn, uh, and um, yeah, it was rough. I, I got taken away from my mother because she had left the stove on. Uh, fire almost happened. Fire department came. They uh, banged down the door or whatever. Uh, went with Aunt Lillian. She she was a, I guess you could can't say uh, one of those old Irish ladies that are like heavy drinkers, but like functioning to the point where it's like. Uh, you know, that's just who she is. Uh, so I got a lot of whoopings, man. I got I got my ass beat a lot. Uh, you know, I was out of control, running up and down the streets, letting tires out of people's cars and shit, climbing out of windows. So I used to get whoopings a lot. I went to school. That was like four or five. Uh, ACS came and took me away, and they put me in foster care. Um, mother was, uh, you know, still fucked up, uh, heavily addicted, uh, to crack and you know heroin and she was she was pretty much doing it all so uh stood in the foster care system for like i want to say almost three years um uh, my mother and father came together decided to you know do the right thing and get me back uh mother was in a program called samaritan village i don't know if you ever heard of it no it's a drug rehab back in the day uh it's like uh the osborne associations or stuff like that um she she passed out with flying colors, and they said, you know what, we're going to give you your child back. Six months later, she relapsed. So we uh, we we were with my father. Yeah, my fault, bro. My fault. No, you're good. It's just I, I'm, I'm double. I'm hearing double. Yeah, you're the, it's, it's, you're you're not you used hear to yourself it. talking. Yeah. yeah, and then it's like, it's crazy. Bro. <laughs> no, you don't have to wear the headphones. Yeah. I don't? No, if you don't want I to. Don't, yeah. I, I like, like it because it like locks you in, you know? Yeah. 
No, just pull the mic a little closer, and then you're yeah, you're all right there. You're good. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, my mother. Uh, you know she 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 was doing bad, man. Um, six months in, relapsed. Father's out to sea. Um, you know we went back to Brooklyn. He had got a house in Tom's River, um, New Jersey. So he was out there chilling and stuff. Uh, Did you blame? Your parents for going into foster care, or were no, you too I, young I, to put blame on them at that time? I didn't know what was going on. I was actually, I was just you know alone for the ride, bro. It was a ride, you know. Um, first first home I went to, I was distraught. I was crying, screaming, yelling. Uh, they had to move me to a different foster home because it was like way too much for me. Like, um, yeah, overwhelmed, cried myself to sleep, and then you know. The next day, they moved me somewhere else. I was there for about two weeks. I was there, uh, good, good family, great vibes, and then uh, a distant relative on my mother's side got custody of me. Um, in the process, my mother was doing the program, trying to figure it out, get me, uh, you know, situated, see if she can get me back. Uh, nine times out of ten, they'll give the kid back to the mother. Um, so you know that was on her side, and then the fact that my mother. Um, got back with my father, and they came together collectively. You know, it made a stronger case for them to actually get me back. But there's a lot of factors in that. You know, my father's a merchant marine. He's not going to get up and say, hey, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. This is a livelihood. Um, you know, my mother, redheaded, wild high, wild child. Uh, so it's a bad mix. Um, they're both originally from Flatbush, Brooklyn, Church Avenue. Um, they knew each other since they were young, and then, you know, Eventually, in time, you know, things came together, neighborhood love, and um, that's where I came about. But they didn't have it together. The, the recipe for what was supposed to take place, they didn't have it. They didn't have the right ingredients. So you had a broken childhood. Yeah, no. And then after that, I went to, uh, so my, my mother, she uh, decided to say, you know what, we're going back to Brooklyn go back to Brooklyn but before that she uh she had some kids some some teenagers in the, in, in the neighborhood tune me up like pay them to tune me up and say yo listen if you're going to Brooklyn you need to be prepared so wait so your mother paid someone to have kids beat you up well paid the kids the the older kids and yeah yeah because she up. knew we were going back to Brooklyn wow so um yeah this one kid for like the last week we were there before we went to back to Brooklyn uh they tuned me up every day bro like and it just you know it, it was something new to me because you know i wasn't used to the, that kind of uh you know forceful you know aggression i got whipped every once in a while but nothing like that so uh when we got to brooklyn my mother we went to a, a friend a close friend of the family's house uh their house and she pretty much took over man and kicked me out with a with a piece of paper with my address on it i said yo go figure it out I'm nine in Brooklyn, Flatbush, with a big ass silver bike. I go out there, uh, figure it out. I, I link up with a few few kids that are going through the same thing. So when it comes to like uh, like drug addicts, usually they have kids, right? So usually those kids from the drug addicts know each other and they become like a little crew. You know what I mean? So um, that's what happened. We uh we started running around robbing people, stealing stuff. You know, we're not eating like that. Food is scarce. This is 90, 95, 94. And you're nine, ten years old. Yeah. How we, would uh, people characterize you back then? Like, if we had one of your ten year old friends with you here today, how would he say you were back then? Um, just surviving. A like, survivor. Surviving. Um, I would say that uh, we were all going through the same thing. We. Were, we didn't really know who we were, let alone uh, who our friend, you know, who we were around, too, because we were all going through our same thing. Like, um, I seen somebody get killed at the age of nine, ten, nine, ten, you know what I mean? Um, mother and a friend or partner or whatever you want to call it, uh, they uh, they did some bad things to somebody, and I never seen them again. I, I don't know if that's actually, you know, but uh, when I saw him, he wasn't moving. You know what I mean? And then it never got brought up again. Did you feel alone at that age? Of course. Even though I had friends, I had, uh, you know, 
nobody, man. I had nobody really depend on. I had a dog named Tiger. And you found a lot of love for that dog. <sighs> Best friend, bro. Guardian Angel. You know what I mean? Uh, we used to get into a lot of fights in the neighborhood. We always used to get into little, you know, block brawls and, you know, Flatbush is known for robbing. So it's like a rites of passage. Uh, wherever you go, either you're robbing or you're getting robbed. So when I had this dog, man, nothing happened to me. Like this dog was a German Shepherd. It just popped up in the backyard one day. I had another dog back there where she was, you know, a little older, not really agile. And she was in heat. And uh, we found Tiger in the back. And he just never left my side. Funny story, story with that is the way I lost him was my mother was, she was whooping my ass bad, bad, bad. He came in from the backyard. He backed her in a corner and shook her. Like grabbed her titty and shook her. The dog and, did? Yeah. He jumped right in front of me. Like he wouldn't let her out the corner. And I've always thought to myself, hey, this dog had to be some kind of police trained dog. The German Shepherd, this dog was on hand commands. If I stopped, he stopped. If I went, he went. If I climbed a car, he climbed a car. Like if anybody came and had any aggression towards me, this dog was going to let you know, like, you need to back up. And I'm young, you know what I mean? So um, she sent me away to sleepaway camp. When I, come, when I came back, man, he was gone. Never seen him again. I was crying through the neighborhood, walking around the neighborhood, you know, crying and shit. Uh, older dudes are like, nah, we ain't see. They always saw the dog with me. So they're like, nah, we ain't see him. So, you know, that was one of my best, best friends when I was growing up. Um, and you think your mom t put him somewhere? I don't know. Gave him away? Yeah, she. Do you think if she never did that, you never would have ended up in prison because you had, like, that companion? No, nah, we, were, we, were, we were doing, I was robbing people with that dog. You know what I mean? Like, it came to the point where, like, we were just, just outlaws, bro. Now, like, when you say you're robbing people, are you robbing people because you need to eat because you have no food? Yeah, or? there was no. They, so back then, uh, there's massive amounts of food now. I don't see kids ever going hungry now. Back then, like uh, there was days that I didn't eat. You know what I mean? Like, and when I did eat, it was like shit from the Chinese store, like chicken wings and French fries and shit like that. Um, I think about it now with my kids. I'm like, yo, uh, there was days of, at, days upon days that I went without food. You know what I mean? And now it's just, uh, it's different. It's there's so much food. It's like everybody's just, you know what I mean? So you have kids now. Yeah. Do you ever think to yourself and and recall the memories that you had with your mother that you never want to be that kind of parent to your kids? Of course. Um, I learned everything. Uh, you know how to avoid, uh, I don't know how to say this, uh, I did everything opposite of what my mother did. You know what I mean? Like, uh, she had, a, she was a loving, caring person underneath all that other stuff, but she also had um, her issues that she never dealt with. You know what I mean? So, um, I don't blame her. You know, we all go through this uh, journey of life and we pick up things and sometimes we're strong enough to shake it, but sometimes we're not. Unfortunately, I don't think she had or she's, she was put through too many things to really find her way out. So, you know, um, even though she didn't teach me a lot of things, I learned a lot. And you still have love? Of course. It's my mother. So isn't that interesting that someone that could be so even mentally, physically abusive to someone, and maybe not directly physically, but by her actions caused you to be you know, physically and mentally abused, you still had so much love for that woman because she was your mother. Um, I'm sorry. I was just thinking about, I was just thinking about my mom. Say that one more time. No, I'm just like, I'm curious just about how someone that was in your position still has so much love for someone that created an environment that wasn't necessarily the best for you. So it goes to, uh, I guess, I don't hold resentment, bro. You know what I mean? Um, everything, that I take it as everything that I've been through was for a reason. And everything that I went through, you can learn something from. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, I can't walk around with that weight. You know what I mean? I've been through enough. I got enough shit that I've been through to have that on top of the things that I've been through. And then still having to let those things go, I wouldn't be able to do that if I was to carry around all the bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's just, yeah, I'm on a journey, bro. You know what I mean? Were you using uh, drugs or alcohol during your teenage years? Nah. You never um, got into it? Nah. I um, smoked weed, you know, but 
seeing my mother and living in crack houses and, you know, um, living in the streets and bouncing house to house and, you know, group homes, forced homes, it's never been my thing, bro. I see my mother go from a beautiful, healthy woman, you know, come, just coming out of rehab and then six, seven months later, man, looking like Skeletor, bro. No, we, we've had quite a few guests on where a reoccurring theme is that the parent used and they became a user themselves. Mm. So do you, are you, do you believe that it doesn't run through the bloodline or, or biologically then? I think I uh, endured so much trauma because of that particular, th- because of drugs, that it almost felt like I was on drugs without being on drugs. So imagine being on drugs. You know what I mean? Um, I wouldn't be. I I wouldn't want to feel that way, and then actually went through it sober. You know what I mean? Like there's, for me, there is nothing but debt behind people who take drugs. You know what I mean? As much as you want to try to get rid of whatever it is that you're going through or have been through, when you're done with that high, bro, you're 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 ten steps behind, and then the next time you're trying to get twenty steps ahead, but then you're thirty steps behind. You know what I mean? So it's like. It's just never made sense to me. Yeah. Do you end up graduating high school? Do you finish high school? Nah, man. I dropped out of school out of fourth grade, man. At fourth grade? Yeah, it was bad. Uh, so I didn't have any clothes. There was really no food. My mother, she's like drugged out of her mind. Uh, it was bad, man. We, I, I would not go to school purposely because I didn't have anything to wear and I didn't want to get joked on. Kids would make fun of you because of your... Hell yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that that was a thing, too. <clears throat> no food. I'm worried about what I'm going to eat. I'm starving, you know what I mean? I'm running around the streets. I don't want to be in a house with my mother because fucking crack everywhere, you know what I'm saying? It's a cloud of smoke everywhere you go. I used to sleep in the hallway, like, literally, because I didn't want to be around that shit. Like, it came to the point where um, dealers used to step over me while I was sleeping because, you know, party is all night long bro they're in and out like they used to, i used to sleep on a baby mattress bro like i ain't even take nothing from the room i found a baby mattress put it in the hallway and that's where i would sleep and they would step over me it's crazy do you think that if you stayed in school your life would have turned out differently or do you think you were you were on that path regardless school or no school if i had a secure environment with some food and some clean clothes that would have been something I could have focused on. So you think all the trouble you would later get into stemmed from being hungry? Fuck yeah, bro. That's wild. Like a basic human need taken from you. And then, and, and then not for nothing, uh, Flatbush Brooklyn is just like, if you don't have it, you take it. You know what I mean? So it's like uh, different parts of the city have different trades, if you should say. You know what I mean? Uh, Flatbush is um, take it by any means necessary. Yeah. Or get God, either or. Now, I know you were, you know, in and out, juvenile detention. You've been arrested multiple times. But mm-hmm. there's one specific instance that I want to focus on, on on today's interview that really landed you in trouble. Yeah. And, and gave you a story. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Bring it up. Well, uh, let's start from the beginning of that. Walk me through that day. Which what story? Ex- I've been through a lot. I mean, it's. <laughs> All right. So specifically, I'm thinking that it was a car incident. There was a car incident with the um, stabbing. Someone got stabbed, right? Oh, yeah. so yes. Th- that's the one that gave you the long prison sen- yeah. sentence. Yeah, um, so this time I just got out of juvie. Uh, I think I'm like, uh, but no. So I get, I, get, I get out of juvie. I go to the group home. I leave the group home. I go AWOL. I'm on the street for like maybe, I don't know, maybe a year. Yeah, 17, 18. Yeah, about a year, right? Um, I catch a gun charge. I go cop out to the gun charge, and I come home um, eight months later, which is a year on Rikers Island, right? Um, come home. I ain't got nowhere to go. I link up with a kid that I'm in a group home with before or prior. Um, we've done some things. We, we, we've we had some fights, uh, street fights and robberies, and we're kind of we're cool. You know what I'm saying? This is like, I want to say I want to call on my brother. You know what I mean? Like, so... Um, come out, I ain't got nowhere to go. So I say, yo, listen, man, I'm trying to rent a room. Uh, you know, I'm still robbing shit. I'm like, literally, like, in the street, like, going crazy. Still, like, 
calculated, but I'm getting into the shits. <clears throat> it gives me a room to the stay. Uh, just what happens at this particular house is, uh, you know, uh, how can I say this? So he's gang related, right? So he he's involved with a gang. Uh, at this particular time, I'm 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 repping uh, my set. And I'm Crip from Flatbush. I'm I'm wilding. I'm doing craziness, bro. I'm running the streets. I don't give a fuck about nothing. My mother just died. So on top of everything, it's just I really, I could care less. Um, gets me a room. Unf- uh, so happens that this whole house is Latin King, right? I'm Crip. It's my man from the group home. He fucks with me. He gets me the room. They looking at me like, yo, what is he doing here? Why is he here? You know what I'm saying? I'm still rocking flags and crates and I'm hardcore into this shit. Like, I'm ready to go at any time. Get rich or die trying shit. So, um, I'm there for a little while. I'm renting my rooms. I'm going back and forth to Brooklyn. This is in Staten Island. Um, you know, pay my rent, do my thing. Just so happens one night, um, they had a brother that died a year previous, right? He, he uh, something happened where I think, uh, he was involved with something that happened with uh, him getting uh, stabbed or thrown off a roof. Can't really put my finger on it. I can't remember. But uh, this whole house is, you know, at a memorial for him. It's a year to his death date. They're lighting candles. They're signing cards. They're doing everything. I'm in the house. I just came back from doing whatever it is that I do. Um, you know, one of these guys come back looking for other people to help. They're in this fight with uh, some, you know, a rival gang, supposed to be like 20 of them, bats, bottles, sticks, chains, everything. Um, He comes back, I'm the only one there. He's like, yo, uh, we're up there getting it in. Immediately, no hesitation. I run up there, assess the situation, gets crazy. Fighting, knock on somebody out, grab a rebar, hit them in the face, and then the police put their lights on. So everybody's like ready to go, scrambling. I run. Go behind a house on a garage. I'm there for like 40 minutes, 45 minutes, literally on my splinter cell shit. So I'm there listening to the cars go around. <laughs> There's a fucking pacing around. You hear the engines roaring. You hear somebody yelling, yelling he's going to bleed out. Call the ambulance. I'm like, oh, shit. Stay there. Jump down. Go into somebody's porch. It's still, it's still crazy. It's quieting it down now. It's like maybe an hour in. Stay there for another 45 minutes. It's quiet now. I go in front of the person's house that I've been in the backyard and take off my shirt, take off my shoes, smoke a cigarette, and just watch. It's like 2, 3 in the morning. This girl walks by, and I'm like, yo, I got to get to the train tracks so I can get back to the house because where this happened is there's a train trial, trolley, old bandit train tracks in Staten Island. Uh, looks over this one particular uh, street and the house that I was in was like two blocks away from that street and you could take the train track so I uh, asked this girl hey listen can you walk with me to the train tracks you know I'm in a little bit of a jam um, she looks at me like I'm fucking crazy and keeps it moving so I'm like yo she's gonna go and tell somebody I gotta go I gotta move so she's like a block ahead of me now where she stops is where the, the gate is to get to the top of the the train tracks so as I walk by, I say, yo, I apologize, I'm going to start you. She's around a bunch of people, and I run up the side of the fence, and I get on the train tracks. I do the military crawl, pass it, because I'm like, yo, the police are right here. They're going to see the train tracks. They'll see me walking. So I got there. I jumped down. I'm going to run for two weeks. Now, this particular house, like I said, was ran by another another gang. Their uh, higher up, whoever was in charge of them, was like on me. Like, he's feeling me, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know them, they don't know me. I know one person out of this whole group, and he's like, yo, you know, you just went out there and did your thing, and, like, it's nothing. So I'm trying to get out of there. Previous to this, Staten Island had a thing where two cops got killed, and a guy tried to get on a ferry, but he dressed as a woman. So I said, you know what, man, that's not going to work. I need to get off this island. I'm going to have somebody drive me off. This guy is, you know, he's trying to you know, big things up, and I'm going to take advantage of this. Um, I say, yo, listen, I need a robbery, so I can have some money, I can, get, I can know where I got to go, and I can do what I got to do. He's supposed to set this up, brings me out there on the dry run, go back to the house. This is in the two weeks. The two-week mark, he comes back, he's like, let's go. 
I'm not ready. Mentally, emotionally, I'm just, oh shit. I'm like, all right, fuck it. Throw my shirt on, jump in the car, and I'm just like, something's not right. Put my seatbelt on, he's talking. He rolls down my window. I'm like, yeah, we're not doing that. I roll back up the window. I'm like, why the fuck would he do that? I'm on the run for a fucking body, bro. Like, what, what are you doing? Driving, post going to the direction of where we went before. It's late, it's dark. <clears throat> he's popping, he's talking. Like, he's never talked like this before, bro. He's like one of those uh, 48 laws of power kind of guys. You know what I'm saying? Real quiet. So he's, he's making small talk, and I'm like, yeah, something's not right, man. I feel it in my gut. Something's not right. We stop at a light. He's like, yeah, da, 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 da. I smell like onions. Yo, he never put his fucking hands down, bro. How much, um, gang intelligence comes on the side of the car. There was another kid in the back seat. They take him, put him on the back. Take him, put him on the back. He ain't no driver's registration, no nothing. I'm like, get on the back of the car, big man. Now, mind you, I just came home from a gun charge. So I got weapons I, on my jacket. I got violence. I got all kinds of shit, gang-related, all kinds of shit. So... They searched me about three, four times, throwing me into uh, the gang intelligence vehicle, holding up traffic. He's still on the back of his car. Who shows up? Fucking homicide, bro. They pop up. They hold up traffic for like five minutes, bro, smoking cigars, talking to this kid that just brought me, was supposed to bring me on the, um, the robbery. They're like, yeah, big man, go ahead, get out of here. Jumps in the car and peels off like he caught a robbery, bro. Never seen him again. They take me in, I'm like, yeah, we're charging with this, this, and I'm like, yo, I don't know nothing, da, 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 murder in a second. Charged with murder in a second, sitting on an island now, I call my girl at the time, I'm like, yo, they got me, it's over, go ahead, live your life, it's over, I'm done. She's like, oh. I'm like, all right, she's like, I'm gonna stay, I said, okay. Uh, it was, I just had to let her know, yo, listen, it's, I'm, I'm going to be doing some time. I'm not coming home, you know what I mean? Like, this is going to be a slow stretch, so I understand. If you got to go, go. She holds it down for a little bit, but, you know, shit happens. Um, so, fighting this case for about a year. Six months into fighting this case. And mind you, I don't know none of these kids. I just know that one kid from the group home, supposed to be like my brother. Him and this other kid, I have five Cody's. So let's get to that. There's five of us, right? One being him, one being me, and three, uh, three others. His, uh, the person that he he was with when he started selling, they came together and they started selling the DA, uh, whatever. They let them out the side door after six months. So now it's me and these two other kids that I really don't know. I just went up there, you know, just to get it in, and um, you know, they they said. We thought you would be the one to tell. We don't know you. And I'm like, yeah, that's crazy, right? And the crazy part is I didn't even go up for them. I went up for my man that told on all of us. So someone snitched on the whole thing? Well, two of them, really. They, they, there was two of them. They, uh, they turned. What is murder in the second? Like, what does that mean? 125.25. It's, uh, so it's not premeditated. It's, oh, no, that's 120, 125.20, I think. Um, it's not premeditated. It just happened. It just so happens that, you know. And you were charged with attempted murder or murder? No, we were all charged with murder in a second. When we finally went to our first hearing, um, there's a lack of evidence. Come to find out, they were fighting 15 minutes before I got there. The police were watching. So you didn't actually kill someone yourself. You no. just happened to be there so, and someone died? Yeah, so in the midst of fighting, someone who got knocked out, um, they jumped on them like fucking hyenas, bro. They were tired of fighting. They were fighting for 15 minutes. But because someone placed you in the room, you get charged with... No, I was there. I I, I contributed to it. Oh, so you did Because when I knocked them out, they stabbed them. Uh, so you were a part of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And then um, after that, I hit somebody in the face with a rebar. They had they had a, they had it all. Bats, bottle sticks, chains, rebar. But you weren't planning on killing this individual that day. No, of course not. I was fucking smoking a joint, looking and thinking about what I was gonna do for tomorrow. When you found out he died, how well, did that make you I, feel? I said, well, honestly, bro. Because um, you're not a killer, man. You grew up, you know, in a traumatic experience. You didn't grow up born to kill, and in this area where you were out, you know. So gang banging, right? Oh, I started gang banging at like ten, eleven. Um, subset of uh, crip set, and we like 
they they trained us, bro. Like we was in into some shit. When it came to the fighting aspect, I knew that it could either be me or them. Like we would we like we were trained to fight. Like when I was coming up in the gang culture, it was start off with a one on one and then two are gonna jump in and you gotta hold it down. And this happened every day. Like in Bro- where I'm from in Brooklyn, bro, that's like it's like a, a rites of passage. You y- get hazed. I've heard that's how you get initiated into a gang, right? Well, yeah. I mean, after that, usually, you know, uh, it's nothing really severe after that. But this particular crew that I was with, we made sure that we got it in every single day. How do you join the Crips? Um, so I didn't actually join. I was actually, I was just told to come. So they just saw you on the street walking and they, they said, knew, hey. I had a little reputation. They used yeah. to call me Billy Badass. Billy so. Badass was your yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I used to run around and rob mm-hmm. and shit. Young age, you know, everybody knew my mother and my situation. So um, I was just a little white boy that ran the neighborhood and just got into a whole bunch of shit. And everybody knew it wasn't really, you know, anybody's fault but my circumstances. You know, the circumstances of where I was living and what I was going through is, you know, the product of what you got. Yeah. If you didn't go on the run, would... The amount of time you got ha- had been less or no? No. Nah, that didn't um, matter? I don't, I don't think that would have mattered because now if I would have stood on a run and, you know, they would have went to trial and court and all that stuff and hearings the way we went, um, I don't know what would have happened. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't think it affected it any any way. Uh, it was going to happen regardless. Do you think the, that law enforcement treated this whole situation differently because it was another gang member that died and not like an innocent civilian? Well, I think because of it was gang related and they seen both sides, uh, you know, it's fucking collectively is like 30 people fighting. You know what I mean? It's five against 20, 25. And so uh, the fact that even in the hearing when they said, uh, you know, they were watching. 15 minutes this whole this whole thing took it was taking place for 15 minutes before somebody came back to the house for help just so happens that I was there and I went up there and I you know did what I had to do but they were doing they were fighting for 15 minutes prior you know five minutes fighting is is a long time unconditioned you know what I mean even conditioned so um, they were tired the police is just watching it they're not doing that they could have stopped it way before all that shit happened. But they didn't do anything. They didn't. They didn't stop it until they saw blood coming from his neck and his head. And this was just a normal, everyday life as a like, gang member? Yeah, yeah, like, so, in the group home, right, a lot of group home kids are gang members. Um, they're like the rejects of, you know, the worst of the worst families of, uh, you know, shit that happens, whether it's abuse, uh, you know, drugs, whatever. We're like the worst of the worst, the bottom of the barrel. So we're going to be doing what's around us. And the only thing that's closest to us is the street. So do you think individuals join gangs because they were lacking something, whether it's in their childhood or in themselves? Um, like what per, but, what propels jo- someone? Joining, a, joining a, a gang at a young age is more a family reliance. It's in a, being a part of it. it, it you want to feel some kind of acceptance and know that you're safe. Um when you join a gang and you're older, man, that's pretty fucking stupid, bro. You know what I mean? But like, guys do it. That's for, it's, it's all for the wrong reasons, and you know how they end up, bro. They, 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 they get taken advantage of some way, somehow. You know what I mean? They're, they're not on the high pecking order. They're, they're, they're at the bottom because it's like, yeah, how? Fucking 30 years old. So what would be your message to a kid that, you know, that's joining a gang uh, at a young age? How would you prevent him to stop from joining? It has to be somebody that's uh, well-respected in the community, that has a hierarchy, that's not going to manipulate or take advantage of that young mind or, um, you know, take advantage and put that person in a bad position for self-gain. It has to be somebody who's unconditionally looking out for the interest of that child. To get them to stop stop it from doing that. Well, that's one thing, but you got to remember resources, everything. So if a kid is hungry, bro, and he ain't got no clothes, there's only so much you can tell him unless you're going to give it to him and say, yo, listen, I got you. You're secure. You ain't got to worry about clothing or food. Let's work on the brain. That's highly, highly likely not going to happen. Do you wish someone was there for you to say that to you when you look back on this whole thing and how you got yourself into this? Um, I believe that if the system, the group home system, um, not even goddamn family court system, but just the group home system. 
if they had uh, implemented a better socializing plan and um, you know a sense of security or a foundation where a kid didn't think he was going to move next week and have to figure it all out because group homes are just like jail. So it's just like going into a, a house, bro. You know, you got to figure the shit out now. Who's running the house? Who's the favorite of the CEO? Who's the guy? What's this? Who's got it? Who doesn't? You got to go through the whole program again. And then you got to find your pecking order. So if you got a kid that's under the staff that's a dickhead, and he's a dirtbag, the house is going to be ran by a dirtbag. You know what I mean? If you got a kid that's in football and he's getting high scholarships or whatever the case may be, the atmosphere of that, chi- that, that, that house is going to be different. So the child coming into there is going to be like, oh, this is a different atmosphere. I feel safe and secure. A lot of the time, it, it doesn't happen like that. Now, do you end up going to trial? Do you take a plea deal? So what we happens? went to our hearings. We were going to trial. In our hearings, uh, the judge came and uh, said, yo, listen, we're beating a dead horse here. Um, come back in chambers. Um, lawyers went back in chambers. They came back with our offer. Uh, one of my co-D's took 13 and a half flat. My other co-D took 10 flat, and I took five flat. So it never made it to trial? No. Um, a lot of evidence, a lot of things that were, you know, could have been done that sh- that weren't, you know what I mean? They should have been done, and they didn't do them. Um, so it kind of worked out on our behalf, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, we wouldn't have been able to take that that plea unless uh, my co-D that took the 13 and a half flat, if he didn't have took it, we would have had to go to trial. Because it would have set a higher standard. It was based off him. Because he was the big fish they wanted. He's, a, he's the one that admitted to stabbing this kid. So doesn't it seem a little unfair that he only got three and a half more years than you? And no, I got five. So Oh, you got five I years. I got five. Okay. Five flat. Uh, the other, my other Cody got 10, and then the 13 and a half flat is what he So took. you got five years. Okay. Listen, I take 13 and a half. When I first went to court and they were telling us, you're listening to 18 in life right now. That's, that's right. what they were saying to yeah, you. Yeah, that's your offer. I, I literally told my lawyer, yeah, I'll take 18 flat right now without that. He was like, whoa, let's go to it. Let's, let's figure this out. This is like my second month in, bro. And how old are you? 18, 19? 19. 19 years old, and you're looking down, life in prison. Yeah, but I would have took anything without that alarm. So do you 18, think I would have been home around this time. You 36. think your lawyer saved you from that? Um, the fact that he was an 18B lawyer and the fact that my other two goatees had paid lawyers, yeah, the gods were with me. Wow. So you take that deal, where do they send you? Do you do um, your time at Rikers or they send so you? So no, I don't know. So you go to Rikers. Uh, I was on Rikers fighting that for about a year and some change, right? Uh, so as soon as you get sentenced, mm-hmm. 30 days, you're out of there. You're going to Downstate or Ulster. In my case, I went to Downstate. Uh, it's just a reception. You go there, they, they classify you to see where you're going to go, what your behavior is like, you know, all that good shit. And then they place you wherever you're going to go. I, fortunately enough, went to Fishkill Correctional Facility. Um, a lot of lifers, a lot of old timers, things can still go down, but, um, you know, it was close to the city. I wasn't getting any visits. I didn't have anybody come see me, but it was, it was good that it felt like I was closer to the city. Um, heard a lot of stories about the CEOs further up top. Um, Horrible, horrible things happen up there. Beat up squads, you know. Um, they're in a gang in themselves, you know what I mean? Those CEOs, they, they uh, take matters into their own hand and set the bar and, you know, put a, a pretty thick atmosphere of uh, fear when it comes to them. Um, I was actually in Fishkill for three and a half years out of that five, and uh, out of that three years, Three inmates got killed by the COs. By the COs? Yeah. How does a CO kill a prison inmate? So um, a lot of the times they say they hang themselves or they fell down the steps. Um, these these particular times, two of these times were by hanging and then another one was by uh, falling and tripping down the steps with cuffs on. Um, they had a real bad beta squad at Fishkill. Uh, a lot of weirdness, you know. Um, they're all related. They all, you know, married to each other or some way, somehow, a cousin of a cousin. Um, this particular CEO that worked the box, his wife worked the yard. Um, I guess this kid said something or she just didn't like him. And she went to her husband after he went. She sent him to the box. And then when he got there, he told her that, told her husband that he flirted with her. It was a wrap after that, bro. He mysteriously hung himself. So there's just so much corruptness by these prison guards. Yeah. 
Do they treat gang mem- gang members any different? Like, do, do you guys have any pull? Do you have leverage as a gang Honestly, member? Honestly, um, you're you're not fucked with um, as much. It's really loners, uh, guys that don't have anybody, nobody that's associated, or just you know they feel like they they know that they can get away with it. So like, if you're a hothead kid that doesn't know his ass from his elbows and he's got his pants sagging and doesn't know shit. That's that's a possibility who somebody who can get got. Yeah. They look for those particular weak, vulnerable people. And I don't mean physically. I mean, you know, just uh, emotional, uh, you know, writer, letters being written or any kind of contact with the outside free world. You know, they, they know. Like, a lot of them have serial killer in, uh, tendencies. They, uh, they just keep on doing it. Like, if you look into anything that comes up with uh, New York State Department of Corrections, their beat-up squads are notorious. The, the, the guards themselves? Yep. And no one's doing anything about this? What can you do? Are you going to do a pop-off and die? <laughs> I mean, like, the, there, there's no, like, oversight committees? They're you, not so looking you at can, this. So, you know, the CEOs play games, man. Uh, grievances get checked. If you're, if they know they're fucking with you, they're gonna make sure that they check your mail before it goes out. So if you're writing to Albany, to the deputy of the deputies, it's not gonna make it. If you're in a box and you're trying to drop a slip for a grievance, it's not gonna make it. If you're trying to mail a letter out, you're not gonna, it's not gonna make it. And have you witnessed that firsthand? Yeah. The the letter never makes it. Yeah. And what do you do? Can you speak up in that situation? It's it's so. Corrupt to the point where, I, like I said, they're all related, bro. They're, it's like a, it's a spider web, bro. Like you'll get caught. Like if they don't fuck with you and you're on the radar, I don't know what to tell you, bro. Wow. Now something I'm interested in too is that when I got to prison, like because I had tattoos and stuff, they ask, you know, gang affiliated this and that. What's it act that intake process like for someone that's actually in a gang? When they ask you, walk us through from the minute you enter, and, and how that works. So on Rikers Island, um, it, it usually within the the inmates' view, you don't really say whether you're affiliated or not. You just figure it out. Yeah. So it kind of makes the ride a little bit more bumpy, but it makes it a little bit more entertaining. So. Um, those who are related, uh, gang related, you know, you don't really say, you don't say, hey, I'm, because then I'll put you in a house that's favorable. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, you're going to the house with your guys. So um, a lot of guys that are like, you know, against the bullshit with the police, uh, they won't say nothing and I just have to figure it out. You usually probably go to a house that just, you know. But if you're jacketed as a gang member, there's no way around it. But if you're not, you're just surfing and you're gang related, it's at your own risk. Now, how do other gang members verify that you're a, a, an active gang member? In Rikers Island? Anywhere, at any prison um, you're so, in. Um, New York State is different, man. Everybody pretty much is uh, to themselves. The, you know, uh, you have certain individuals that, you know, click up and organize and stuff like that. But in all actuality, everybody's into themselves. Everybody's locked in, bro. Like. New York State is a very, we, we have single man cells. We don't have double cells. Oh, you guys have single man yeah, cells. Um, those Attica rights, uh, you know, they they made a lot of things favorable for, uh, you know, doing time and really trying to get yourself together and rehabilitating yourself. Yeah. Um, programs, there's a lot of programs, stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, pretty much everybody, you know, if you're not, Putting yourself in gangs or any kind of homosexual activity or gambling, you know, you're good to go, bro. Why are inmates so against homosexual behavior? Um, it opens up a lot of doors in a place where you shouldn't be opening up doors. It, uh, there has to be a line in the sand. Unfortunately, you know, um, to each his own. You know, everybody has their own style. But, uh, you know, there it's, there's no, there is no room for error. So there's not going to be any kind of misconceptions of anything, and you're not going to put yourself in a situation that possibly could lead to a rumor or allegation. But we hear, so we hear that concept, right? But then it seems like it's an acceptable when certain guys are about like the gay for the stay. I've never experienced that. Never, okay? Because in the Fed, sometimes like there'd be some like gang members high up that they don't get looked at. 
because they're so, allowed to do that. So, you know what? There was a guy that I was in a facility with. He had a long period of time. He had a life on the end. Um, he had a beautiful wife. He was getting trailers. He, they were coming in, seeing him every time there was a visit. And uh, he decided to pick up a relationship in the yard, man. With another man? With another man. And what happened when everyone found out? Everybody just keeps shut, bro. As long as you don't come over here with it, and, you know what I mean? Do your own thing. But it, it left the uh, the understanding of now people know what, how to deal with that. You know what I mean? Whether if he was, uh, you know, um, liked or disliked before, now it's like it's neutral. I, I don't even have to worry about you because you're in another category. You know what I mean? But people still do business with him on the yard? Um, or is he like totally blacklisted and, and nothing can happen? I'm pretty sure it is some you know some way somehow through the through the chain he'll get what he wants. Um, and you know there's a lot of people that don't care about that. They care about their money, but there is a line that they know that would never be passed. And what about you for money? What was your prison hustle? I was broke as shit, bro. Yeah, so you had to, must yeah. have had to do something for so, money. So what I was doing was I, I created a store. Um, I started off with honey buns and bags of chips and, you know, cakes and stuff. And then, you know, in New York State, we're allowed to cook. We have stoves and shit. Wait, you have a stove in prison? Yeah. So really? we have we have mm. pots, uh, we have pans, and we have these two eyes, you know, the portable camping eyes. Mm -hmm. You just plug in and you just... Like a hot stove, a hot stove. A hot stove, yeah. yeah. We get those, and then uh, some jails even have the the griddle. So, you know, um, we, we do stuff like that. So I started off with, you know, movie night kind of products you know what i'm saying chips and honey buns and stuff like that and then i just started growing and growing and then you know um that was pretty much it i didn't really do anything else i worked in the mess hall i got went to the box for stealing some uh ground beef out of the goddamn mess hall uh it's back going back to my unit i had it in my net bag and it was wrapped in a plastic bag so it was the diet tray you know the uh almost like the pepper steak so uh had that in the bag, and I'm going back to my house. I already got it sold, a pound a pack. So I got like 10 pounds. I'm ready to go. CO pulls me over for a search. They check the bag. He's like, yo, you killed somebody? I'm like, we're, we're, there's somebody dead right now? I'm like, nah, that's from the mess hall. He's like, hmm, okay. I went to the box for like 30 days. In the time I was in the box, that's when that, one of those kids got killed from the hanging. Um, he got beat up real bad. You could hear the, uh, you know, flesh hitting flesh and hitting brick. Um, he was in a box above me. Uh, yeah. And then mysteriously he hung himself. Wow. Yeah. What's the box like, the shoe in, in, in New York so State Prison? Usually uh, you have long term, which is S block, shoe 2000. And then you have short term stay, which would be, uh, you know, uh, regular. 25, 30 days in a box, and then you're going back to your unit or back to the compound. But anything over, like, I think it's like uh, 60 or 90 days, you're going to another jail. You'll go to that particular box that's a jail in itself, and then from there, they'll ship you off to wherever they're going to send you. And you're just alone in the cell all day. So in those, you have, in the S block, you have double bunk. But you can always say, listen, I'm not bunking with nobody. And they don't? fight that they say okay no problem it all depends on how much you want to put a fight it depends on how mm -hmm. serious you are like if you if, if you got fucking 90 days that would be pretty stupid you know what i mean but if you got to stay you know what i mean you stab somebody or cut somebody you got a year or two in the box i don't want nobody in and did you take a cellmate or no um so when i went to the box yeah oh so the short-term stay i i had single but um on this recent bit that i did when i went to wall kill um, I had to go to S block. I had gotten into a fight in the yard, almost lost my merit. Um, yeah, but I had to bunk up with somebody. What does it mean to lose your merit? Is that your good um, time? So your merit is like a, a good time, like a, a good time before your CR. So like your CR is your good time, your conditional release date. Uh, with good time not being taken, you can do eighty five percent of your time. With a merit, you do like sixty five. So it all depends on whether you have the programs in or, um, you know, you got whatever requirements, trade or, or however many uh, community service hours on outside gang or whatever, um, you can make that merit. And then you'll be considered to, you know, get out early. And you got into a fight and almost lost it. Yes, yeah, so I got a tier two 
Um, what was the fight over? How did you get involved? Um, you know, bullshit. Uh, I was sticking up for somebody that... Uh, so how could I say this? So with a group of guys that were talking shit about someone that wasn't there. Um, I felt that wasn't right. And I was like, yo, if y'all going to be talking shit, y'all should be talking it to the person's face instead of doing this bullshit, meaning bullshit behind their back. So like, all right, come to the yard. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm like, all right, cool. Whatever you want to do, bro. Um, so I go out there. They're having a little little situation with the guy they were talking shit about. They're trying to clean it up. And, then, you know, then they come to me and then uh, try to figure out what's going on. Um, I didn't like their energy, man. I told them, yo, what's up? And they popped on me, and I beat their ass in the yard, and then I went to the box, and um, I ended up getting a tier two, but I got 30-something 30, 30 days uh, referred, I think, like, five or something, and then um, I went back to the same jail with the same kids that I got into the fights with. Wow. I actually went to the, the house of the person that I had the problem with. Mm-hmm. Like, they put me back in the house. I don't know if it was just uh, because I showed out and they, they feel like, you know, maybe they needed some retaliation or something. But um, that never happened. I ended up going to Merit, um, got my Merit, and I came home. What what year did you come home? 2019, May 6th. Was that the last time you were ever in prison? Yeah. Why did you decide to turn it all around after prison? Because you had you lived your whole life up to then in and out of juvenile detention and out of prison, getting in trouble. What what did it take for you to, to get on the straight in the arrow? Oh, my kids, bro. Uh-huh. You had kids before you went into prison. So yeah, so so uh, the last uh, sentence I just did was a one and a half to three. Um, grand loss and the fourth. Um, I was going through hard times. Um, falling, you know. Going into the stash was a little, you know, getting real low. Um, so I, you know, put out some smoke signals and, you know, somebody let me know somebody. And so then I went and I did what I had to do, but he ended up telling on me. Uh, plug, you know, he got caught up and he uh, told him. So I ended up taking the uh, one and a half to three. In the process of that, I had just got my kids from their mother. Um, they were being abused by their mother. Um, so I got them. A month, police come knocking on my door, bro. I go to the door. I kind of knew what it was, but I was like, you know what? Let's see what's about. Go down there. I'm like, yeah, this is what we got. Da, 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 da. I'm like, all right. So they bring me in. I bail out. Um, I'm going to court for this, right? And then I'm also going to family court for my kids. Uh, they being abused by their mother, so they're with me. Um, now, when I realized that I'm going to end up doing some time, I had to let them know, you listen, um, I don't have anybody to watch them. You know what I mean? I'm going to go do this time. I think it'd be best, hopefully, their mother learn from this situation and, you know, they don't have to go and assist them. Um, so they end up giving her back to the, their mothers. Uh, I end up turning myself in. So 90 days on that bid, they get taken away from her. So they're in the system. While I'm doing a bid, and um, I'm trying to get home as soon as possible, bro. That probably brought a flood back of memories to you when you were Man, in the system. I felt like a piece of shit, bro. Mm. Like, I felt like a failure, you know what I mean? Like, I went through this shit, and now my kids are kind of going through the same shit, you know what I mean? So it's like, so I'm like, yeah, I have to get home as soon as possible. So I'm not trying to fuck around, I'm not, you know what I mean? Uh, always you call out some mandatory so you know I'm already on that time always everywhere I go so that's not a that's not a problem but like anything else after this losing good time I'm like yo I'm my kids are gonna be put in like for adoption bro um so I'm fighting for this merit I'm trying to get everything I need and then that shit happens um I'm thinking yo it's over bro I'm gonna end up doing three years they're gonna end up going in the system and being awards to the state because you only have two years after um kids are put in a the system, they have uh, permanency hearings. And if they don't find a conclusion on what's going to happen, whether or not these kids are going back to their family or they're going to go to f- put up for adoption, we got to figure it out. You only got two years to do that. So um, I came home May 6th. I was in the courts May 6th 
putting in petitions and making sure that uh, you know none of that stuff happened. I started getting visitation, um, and then they finally came home with me, and they've been home with me ever since. And what did you end up getting into for work? Uh, so I'm in a union. I do a, a construction. I'm a laborer. Was, seven, was seven it thirty one? Was it hard to get into that? With someone with an attempted murder charge on your record, um, among a um, lot of other criminal charges. Nah, um, so, for for guys like me that, um, you know, had rough lives and you know, had to f- make it and by any means necessary, and they got some blemishes. If you ain't got no fucking sex offense or you know um, some heinous, serious, crazy, um, that's where you would want to be, bro. You would want to go to construction. I mean, it's not the, you know, ideal thing to do, but that's... There's nothing wrong with construction, man. Yeah. Nothing no, at all. Not at you know, all. working hard, getting getting into that labor and everything. My body does not agree with that, <laughs> but my mind does. But I'm sure it feels good to go work hard, provide for your kids, yeah. be there for them, of give course. them a childhood that you weren't able to get yourself. Without a doubt. I mean, I, that's got to be a great feeling. And it gives hope to other people because I get a lot of messages from people that say, they can't find work or they're struggling to find work. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure this is going to be reassuring for them. That it's all what you put into it. And honestly, if, if you want to work, there are, there, there, there's jobs and companies that will hire you. Um, but when it comes to the union, like you have to. So the way I got into the union was they were having a lottery um, back in 2014. They had uh, 300 applications out of the 300 applications, 30 would get chosen. I stood on that line for a whole day, bro, in the snow. Like, that's, like, one of the only ways other than really having, like, a father or a brother or uh, my uncle that's in the union. That's, like, the only way you can really get in, bro. You think it was because you were determined that you did that? Without a doubt. Because there's a lot of people in your position that can't do that, that can't get themselves up and sit there and do it and get a good paying job. That doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. Because uh, if you want something enough... You would definitely go and get it, bro. How's your relationship with your kids now? Um, good. Uh, you know, kids are kids. They're, they're growing up. They're so my son is being uh, moved up a grade. He got skipped. Um, he's doing fantastic in school. Like he's straight shooter. You know what I mean. So I'm happy about that. Um, my daughter, she's doing a great. She's doing great in school. She's into the fashion thing. And then my oldest daughter, she's doing her thing. She's into like uh, cosmetology <laughs> and all this other stuff. So. I'm happy, bro. You know, um, have you envisioned what that conversation is going to look like when you sit down, kind of tell them more about your past and say, um, hey, this is what your father did and this is how I'm going to be a better person? So because of the severity of what they went through, um, I, I try to be in reign with honesty and, and, and not, you know, clouding or idolizing things. Um, I'm trying to give them in slow doses, but I don't lie to them about what I went through, about, you know, the, the grandmother, the grandfather, what I went through, um, foster homes, uh, the system in general. Um, small doses, but it's all truth. Yeah. I can't, you know, I don't know anything else, bro. What do you think your message is to someone that's, you know, listening and watching this? They hear your story. They hear where you came from, what you went through, and who you are now. What do you want them to take away from this? Um, I would have to say that if you really want something, you can manifest it. You can manifest it, right? But you have to put in the work. There has to be, you know, um, opportunity and stuff. But sometimes you have to just be patient. You know what I mean? But it's all what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. If you self-loathe and are depressed and poor me and I can't get out of this, that's where you're going to stay, bro. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just got to shake that shit off and just keep on trucking. You know what I mean? Um, It's hard to say that to a grown man. You know what I mean? A child is different. It's something that they can, uh, you know, eventually conceive. Um, But... It, 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 it has a lot to do with willpower, bro. How does it make you feel when people judge you because of your past? Because I'm sure that happens. Um, like whether it's an employer or a woman or anything, people that meet you. I know that they can go through the shoes that I walk in. You know what I mean? They Not even just for a week, bro. You know what I mean? So um, I don't take it personal. It is, it's 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 a ignorance on their behalf. You know what I mean? And it's unfortunate that... Uh, 
you know, they can't empathize. Does it hurt you though when they when people don't give you a chance? Um Honestly, I, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to take a chance from someone uh that doesn't really have the best interest for me in the first place, you know what I mean? It would have to be that uh that person that wants something to be, uh, you know, perpetuated in a good way. Yeah, it's like that old saying, you know, why would you want someone that doesn't want you in yeah, your life? Exactly. So if that person's not willing to accept who you are for what you did and who you are now, then why even bother and waste that energy? Yeah, it's, 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 it, it actually it puts you in debt, bro. It's like a anchor, a ball and anchor, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, Will, thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. Hey, bro, it's great talking pleasure. to you. Thank you for reaching out to us to come on the show and, and share your story. I know it could be a little intimidating and you yeah, don't know yeah. what to expect, but hopefully this experience is, has been good for you. No, uh, yeah. Um, and, I'm, I'm shaking it off. Yeah, no, it's great, man. And, you know, safe travels back to New York and mm -hmm. you, you're, you're getting ready to start a podcast yourself. Or? Yeah, so I, I have something that's up and running now. It's called Stuck in the System. Um, I'm getting into the groove of talking about things that I've been through and then exposing the system for what it really is um, on all aspects. Uh, when it comes to, you know, just the social so social aspect of it all the way to the prison aspect of it, it's all connected, you know what I mean? Yeah, and we'll plug all your information into the Appreciate bio. That, People can check it out. You're on YouTube, right? Yeah, YouTube, uh, TikTok, and uh, Instagram as well. Awesome, man. Well, we look forward to it and, you know, wishing you the best of success. Thank you, bro.